the floor okay. is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, the Indian food was quite the draw, and it was a little intuitive today, so I appreciate that. Um, my, I have a lot of family in India, and, and we, we love Indian food, and my wife and two kids will be jealous that I got to feast on some great cuisine today. We could put a little to-go package together. I might ask, I was going to ask you both. <laughs> so, so why am I here? Um, Thank you to those who invited me, and Ingrid, if she's here, I think, Nelson, thanks for inviting me. Um, Ingrid and I have had a couple conversations over the year about this, this topic, specifically the growth in the Grand Rapids area with international families, and those that are here that we weren't aware about, and those that are coming in because of uh, just the, the industry, the medical community, uh, the education community, and so as professionals, service professionals, we need to get up to speed on these issues that affect <coughs> uh, folks with foreign ties. And in my world, in the, in the legal business, probably five years ago, I didn't really have much of an international practice. Now I would say 30 to 40% of the work I do is with families who have international ties, whether that is <coughs> they've come from overseas, Maybe they're transitioning overseas because of uh, employment or their position. They have family overseas. They have assets overseas. And so there, there is a, a lot of comp uh, complexity and moving parts. And there are a lot of different rules that apply to these types of situations. On the uh, real estate side, you know, I was having some conversations with folks earlier here about, you know, in my opinion, I think all of you as real estate professionals really have, um, you, you may spend the most time initially with families that come in from overseas because you are probably one of the first touches that they have when they're looking for a place to live, uh, to rent, even to buy. Um, maybe you have some connection with their organization or employer and so through that organization you are asked to kind of work with this family to help them understand Grand Rapids and the community and where to live. So, you know, unlike us, lawyers are like the dentist. People don't want to call us because, you know, we charge by the hour and, you know, root canals aren't that fun. And sometimes legal projects and legal work is kind of like a root canal. But if they're working with someone that is going to spend a lot of time with them and the model isn't where every time you talk to me, I, I'm going to charge you, I think that is uh, a little bit more appealing and so this is a great group to talk to about these issues and my goal today is to help create awareness of what I think are the top five issues I see when doing estate planning for international families and a lot of this touches on real estate okay and I'm a tax attorney so you know hence the title of my program five tax traps Oh yeah, no problem. Oh sure, no problem. Yeah. So, so as a tax lawyer, I want to raise the issues that I see um, when working with an international family. They're coming in, or if they're here and they're going out of the United States. And I know that you, this group is, has met with um, an immigration uh, professional, and I, I think from my office and. I'm not here to talk about immigration, okay? I'm here to talk about some tax issues, but in order to get to the tax issues I want to talk about, we're going to have to take a step back and methodically go through some basic foundational tax rules. So I don't want to lose anybody, and I can be kind of a loud talker, so if I catch anybody dozing off, that's when my voice is going to go up. But this is very important. We've got to get through a couple of foundational basics before we can get to the really juicy real estate issues. And one of the real estate issues I want to talk to you about today is FERPTA. FERPTA is the Foreign Investment and in Real Property Tax Act. It's a hidden landmine that can creep up on any real estate tax accounting professional. And so we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about FERPTA. This is just a disclaimer that I, my firm makes me put on these, but you can ignore it. 
So, so trap number one is the concept of worldwide taxation. And I was looking over this presentation last night, and my four-year-old daughter said, you know, Daddy, what's the title of this? This, what are you looking at? I said, I'm talking about uh, tax traps. She says, tax traps, we need to keep everybody safe. And I'm like, okay, well, and I was thinking about it this morning, and she's actually, she's quite right. I mean, what I want to do for you today is to try and prevent some of these traps, and in essence, keeping you safe from falling into them. First trap is worldwide taxation. What do I mean by that? We have a system here in the U.S. on how we tax our residents, our citizens, and our non-residents, okay? This chart lays out the two big classifications that we're going to deal with today. I've got a pointer here. We have a U.S. resident and we have a non-resident, and there are essentially two main types of tax in our federal system. One is income tax and the other is transfer tax. We all know what income tax is. We pay it every year. We get our 1040s in place <clears throat> by April 15. We pay the federal government if we haven't withheld enough. And that's income tax report. The other type of tax is transfer tax. And I'm talking about estate and gift tax. So the federal government wants to tax us on the privilege of transferring assets to somebody else. And so there's going to be a transfer tax assessed when assets leave you and go to somebody else. There are a slew of exemptions, okay? <clears throat> but there still is that tax. And the question is, if I do make a transfer, do I fall into an exemption or do I fall into a taxable transfer, okay? So for U.S. residents, <clears throat> U.S. residents, for income tax purposes, are those individuals that have a green card, so they're lawful <coughs> permanent residents here in the United States. They have spent enough time in the U.S. to trigger what's called a 183-day test, or they've made an election. So let's say you have a person that's married to a resident or a citizen and that person elects on a tax return to be treated as a resident. If you are dealing with a resident, okay, you're going to have worldwide taxation. So you know that the individual who is a U.S. resident, because they have a green card, they spent enough time here, or they make an election, is going to have to report their worldwide income on a U.S. tax return. That's a big deal. And so there's a lot of planning involved in trying to prevent this type of situation, this worldwide taxation obligation, okay? If you don't fall into this test where you have a lawful permanent resident, you haven't been here enough for the 183 days, or you've made an election, then you are what's called a non-resident. And we're gonna use that acronym NRA for purposes of this presentation. A non-resident is only subject to income tax on their U.S. source income. So we'll go through some examples, but classic U.S. source income, rent from real estate, salary or wages paid for work that is performed in the United States, dividends paid from a U.S. corporation. There are a lot of different types of U.S. source income. So as long as the person is a NRA, they're only going to pay tax to the federal government on U.S. source income. If they fall over that category into a resident, now they fall into the trap of having to report and pay tax on their worldwide income. So being able to spot that kind of classification and issue right away is a building block for where we're going to get to in this presentation. We've talked about income tax. Let's talk about transfer tax. And I'm going to spend more time on the income tax piece, but very quickly on the transfer tax. This is key. We talked about those tests for income tax. Green card, the 183 days, or the election. 
you have a person who's going to be a U.S. resident, if they meet those tests, worldwide income tax reporting. The test for estate and gift tax, which is our transfer tax, is much different. It is not a day counting test. It is not an election test. It is not a green card test. The test is domicile. <coughs> and that really is a subjective and objective test. So you have a client that has come here from overseas or is overseas and is looking to buy real estate here. They have not spent any time in the US. They don't have a green card, but they buy property here. And it is their intent that that property be their home where they will never leave, at least that's their current state of mind. And they have developed some ties here. All of those things add up to domicile, okay? And if this person can establish that he or she has domicile in the US, now for US transfer tax purposes, that person is going to be subject to a state tax on their worldwide assets. So if they still have assets and property overseas, but they have domicile here in the US, everything is counted. Everything is part of their pool of assets that the US government wants to look at when they die to determine if they're gonna owe a state tax. That's a pretty big deal. So <coughs> domicile is the test. So the takeaway is income tax purposes, we have specific objective tests. For state and gift tax purposes, we have more of a subjective test with domicile, okay? So why do we care about all this? Well, if you're a non-resident, if you're an NRA, for income tax purposes, U.S. source income. That's all you're gonna have to worry about. For estate tax purposes, only U.S. situs assets. So perfect example is real estate. You have real estate in the U.S., but this person is not domiciled in the U.S. Their home is still in London or in Bombay or in you know, Dubai, whatever the case may be, if they own assets in the U.S., those are the only assets gonna, that are gonna be subject to U.S. estate tax. So, let's move on. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the specifics, and that's why I tried to put together um, some slides that you could take back some good, useful uh, resource information. <coughs> but here we're talking about estate tax for NRAs. So we've got a non-resident, doesn't have domicile here, what is the federal government going to expose them on for estate tax? Well, here are all the U.S. situs assets. Tangible property that are lo that's located here. U.S. brokerage or mutual fund accounts. Securities issued by a U.S. company. Stock, right? U.S. stock. U.S. real estate. U.S. partnerships or LLC interests. Fine. This is why I made this chart. These rules are not intuitive. Some of these rules were implemented because of policy reasons. We're trying as a country to get non-residents to keep their money here and invest here. So this is a non-U.S. situs asset for an NRA. Take a look at this, cash deposits in a U.S. bank account. Think about that. If there is a financial institution that is a commercial lending institution and the NRA has $500,000 of cash sitting in a bank account, that is not a U.S. situs asset. That makes no sense. But again, this is why the rules are not intuitive. And this is a policy reason. We want to encourage money to stay here and be invested in our commercial banking um, institutions. Here's another one that's not so intuitive. A U.S. life insurance policy on the life of an NRA. NRA goes to Northwestern Mutual takes out a $5 million life insurance policy on the NRA's life, payable to the NRA's kids in another country, okay? NRA dies. As long as the policy was owned by the NRA and on the NRA's life, that $5 million is not gonna be subject to U.S. estate tax. Those are interesting and fundamental rules you need to know because life insurance is a great planning tool for NRAs, and we'll see why with an example in a minute. Here's another 
Here's another not so intuitive rule. We talked about US real estate being US situs. Sorry if I walk around, I, I tend to do that. Um, buy a house here, commercial building here, vacant land, that's clearly US situs real estate. Let's say the NRA takes out a mortgage, gives a mortgage to the bank to buy the property. And so typically we know that mortgages when we give the bank a mortgage, it's a recourse mortgage. The bank's going to not only go after the property as a security interest, but the owner personally if, if the debt isn't paid. Um, if the real estate has any non-recourse debt, okay, then that portion of the real estate, so you got a $100,000 piece of property, you got an $80,000 mortgage, that's non-recourse. That 80000 is not subject to U.S. estate tax. Another one of those interesting rules, but practically speaking, when do we ever see non-recourse debt? That's going away. Most banks that I've dealt with will have a recourse obligation on the note. But another kind of planning technique to help reduce or minimize estate tax liability. Uh, we're not going to talk about the gift tax rules I want to focus on income tax briefly, and then we'll move on. Again, here's another chart with some very not-so-intuitive rules on page 8 of the materials. We're talking about an NRA. What assets does the NRA have in the U.S. for estate tax purposes? We went through that. Now what about income tax? What is the NRA going to have to pay tax on to our government? Well, interest paid by U.S. persons, sure. Dividends paid by U.S. companies, sure. Compensation for personal services performed in the U.S., sure. Let's look over here. This is non-U.S. source income. Interest on deposits with U.S. banks. Again, another one of those rules where if the NRA invests in a commercial financial institution here in the U.S., has money in a depository account that's earning interest, that interest is not subject to U.S. taxation. The bottom two I've highlighted in red because this is kind of an important foundational rule we need to know before we talk about some of the FERC to step. One of the biggest exemptions for NRAs, the biggest income exemptions, is gain from the sale of a U.S. capital asset. You've got a $1 million stock portfolio with a basis of 100, the NRA sells it as a $900,000 capital gain. That's excluded from income. However, there is a carve out for real estate. Real estate is a capital asset. So when an NRA sells real estate in the US, okay, or real estate interest, that is not exempt. That does not fall under this rule. It's under a specific rule for sourcing U.S. real estate gain to the U.S. And that's important. The federal government is not going to let an NRA buy property in the U.S. or invest in the U.S., sell it, make a profit, and not pay tax on the gain. That's not going to happen. So there are rules in place that will make sure that that NRA pays the tax. And that's where FERC is going to come in and we'll talk about that. Does that apply to uh, ordinary income and cap gain? For real estate? Yeah. For gain? For gains, capital gain. Yeah. I mean, most of the time you're, you're hopefully going to fall into a capital category, but if you hold it for a short amount of time and it doesn't fall under capital gains rates, it's still the sale like of a capital income. of a capital asset. Yeah, absolutely. Would, would that fall under REITs as well? How does that work? REITs, uh, U.S. REITs are not subject to FERTA. Okay. Trap number two. We've talked about the foundational rules. I'm going to briefly talk about trap number two, and that's limited exemptions and the marital deductions. Some of you who are familiar with estate planning concepts in our U.S. estate tax system know that if you're married and you and your spouse are both U.S. citizens and you transfer assets to your surviving spouse, either 
to your spouse either during lifetime or at death. The federal government gives us what's called an unlimited marital deduction. There's no tax on that transfer, and it's a free pass. There are some different rules that apply when you have non-citizen spouses involved, and we'll quickly talk about those. U.S. citizens and residents. These are estate tax concepts, so think back. U.S. citizens, most of us are U.S. citizens. Um, We've, we know that a U.S. resident is going to be somebody for income tax purposes who has a green card, who has been here long enough or makes an election. But we're talking about U.S. residents for state tax purposes. So remember that domicile rule? If the, if the person is domiciled here in the U.S., they are going to be a U.S. resident. And so if a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident dies, they're going to be subject to estate tax on their worldwide assets. Now we talked about exemptions. Well, we have a pretty big exemption today on estate tax. It used to be 600,000 per person. So if you died with over 600,000 in assets, you would pay estate tax on every dollar above that $600,000 exemption. Today, it's 5.43 million per person. Okay, so when Obama signed the big tax legislation in 2012, that increased the estate tax exemption to $5 million per person, and that amount goes up every year. So for 2015, me as a U.S. citizen, I could die tomorrow, and if I have more than $5.43 million in my name, I'll pay estate tax. I don't have that problem. It'd be a nice problem to have. <laughs> but... <clears throat> That's the rule, okay? U.S. citizens and residents, and, and currently the estate tax rate, the top rate is 40%. Here's what you need to know. For NRAs, okay, they don't get this 5.43 million exemption. They get 60,000. That's it. And that number has not changed for decades, and it's not adjusted for inflation. So, so think of the potential traps and issues here. An NRA comes to the U.S., is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and wants to live the American dream and buys a piece of property here in the U.S. And that piece of property is worth a couple hundred thousand dollars, single-family home. If that NRA dies, $60,000 estate tax exemption. Anything above that is going to be subject to to a 40% estate tax rate. So knowing these issues, even if you're not an attorney or an accountant, just knowing that these issues are out there is not only gonna create value for your clients, but it's, it's gonna help um, just our professionals, professional services in general with a lot of these families that are coming in, okay? I, I really wanna see Grand Rapids um, not only welcome these families, but really be educated on these types of issues because we just want to keep them coming. Yeah? A lot of my families, um, when they deed their properties, they have their son or daughter join them on the deed. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of what I found. Is that, wouldn't that solve the problem? It would not. No. Okay? It would not because, number one, it depends on whether the family members on the deed are spouses or if they're kind of father son or daughter son or mother daughter mother son right and the rule is that if you don't have a US citizen married couple okay and first owner on the property dies the full value of that property is going to be included and that first decedent's estate. And if that first decedent is a NRA, and the value of that property is over 60000 then you've got an estate tax problem, right? Mm -hmm. So we see that a lot, and there are ways to address this, but this is the general rule, okay? Go ahead. Question is that 60,000 applies to all NRAs or the ones that have 
domicile in the country or the, the ones that don't live and they go home to us or Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that? Yeah. No, so so are you asking does the sixty thousand <coughs> apply only to NRAs? No, the the ones that live here or it applies to all of them the, with domicile in the the one Yeah. If it applies to the those that don't live in the country. Yeah. I mean so 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 to answer your question it gets back to what is the test? <laughs> to be a U.S. resident for state tax purposes and its domicile. If the person has domicile in the U.S., they are not an NRA for state tax purposes. So if they live here, they have ties here, they have bank accounts here, they have family here, their intent is to stay here, then the, the argument is that they are not an NRA for state tax purposes. If instead they're a foreigner, but they bought a piece of property here, they don't really have any ties here, they don't have family here, they don't have bank accounts here, and really the only asset they have here is a piece of real estate, mm -hmm. they are probably an NRA, because there's just not enough support there for domicile. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? All right, so it still falls into that, um, okay, I got it. So, oh, right, if they live here, they pay on everything, and if they don't live there, they pay on this asset. Right? U.S. situs assets, yes. right. But the problem is we all know that, I mean, what kind of single-family homes out there can you get for less than 60000 <laughs> So, So it's likely that if a foreigner is coming here to buy a home or an apartment or a condo, we're going to be above this right away, okay? So this is, the, this is the big rule, this is the takeaway. Now, on the bottom of some of these slides, I have a little asterisk with a note saying, maybe modified by tax treaty. So when these issues come to me, there are a couple things I'm looking at to try and correct the issue. And one of them is, I wanna know what country this foreigner has come from. Because if they are a member of a treaty country, a country that has a US estate tax or gift tax treaty with the United States, there may be a way out. There may be a resolution, and part of the resolution is some estate tax treaties up this number, okay? But if they're not <coughs> from this country with, with the treaty, then what should they do? Is there a way to avoid that or no? Yeah, there are a couple things you can do. And um, I can go through a couple of them um, once we kind of get to the end of the presentation, but one big thing is life insurance. Because remember, if an NRA takes out a life insurance policy on his or her life and is the owner of the policy, okay, that is not subject to U.S. estate tax. It's not U.S. situs. But the proceeds from that policy can help pay any potential estate tax liability. <laughs> That's a real straightforward way of, of doing it. Um, there, are other, there are other ways to address it with entities and um, maybe trying to show that the person is domiciled. So there's a lot of different strategies that estate planning lawyers and accountants may try and work, okay? So with the domicile thing, if someone moves here for a job and they do buy a home, their family is here. Mm -hmm. They've lived here for a year, two years, and then he dies. He, even though he's not a resident, he would be domiciled. Is that correct? You, you made the a great distinction. <clears throat> it's a different test. So, I wouldn't know how to answer your question though if this person had domicile because you've got to go through the factors. It's subjective and objective. And if I were the lawyer trying to show that this person was domiciled and should not have a 60,000 exemption, but instead a 5.43 million exemption, I would really be looking for a lot of facts that showed this person meant for Grand Rapids to be his or her home. And something I do, you know, I, I present on this topic to other attorneys, one thing that I had in another PowerPoint slide, and I. Can email it to whoever wants it, but it's an affidavit of domicile. 
okay? And so what I like to do when I, when I work with international families is I want to know up front what is your intent? What's your story? Why are you here? And what is your intent? And so if the IRS ever audits the situation, I at least, I at least have one good mm -hmm. fact in my file, which is a sworn statement saying that this person intended for the United States to be their home, okay? Just has to be a present intention, okay? okay. I just want to say, because it can change, intentions can change, you know? Absolutely, right. absolutely. Now, six months, yeah, Michigan's my home, I love it here. I don't know, three years? That sounds more likely, right? Um, if they have all of their assets and holdings and family in the UK, and they have a you know, a condo above Founders Brewing Company <laughs> in the U.S., and that's all they have. I mean, domicile doesn't, the, the domicile test looks a little off there, right? Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, Question. Go ahead. Yeah. So this affidavit that you're, that you're talking about, something like for, for us as agents, if we're working with somebody that's looking to buy a home and they want it, you know, we wanted to help protect them. Is that something that you can give us that we can give to them? You can have uh, Just for, my form for, to look at okay. for sure. I mean, so something like that. I mean, is it a good idea to suggest that? I mean, it's, it'd be hard for us to, for me to explain to somebody. Well, in case you die, yeah, I'm smart. Want, you know, or protect Thank you. Purposes. Mm -hmm. One thing I would suggest is, I mean, to me, this would be an attorney's obligation to give clients this type of advice. So then more of us is to, to continue or look out for our clients is to say, you know, I suggest that you Absolutely. meet with someone like you to make sure that they're protected. Right. Another issue too is you, you don't want to, I mean, there may be situations where the client does not want domicile because there are a lot of planning opportunities for non-residents. It may affect their immigration status. Um, it may affect some of their issues with their employment, okay? You know, I do a lot of work for uh, Spectrum physicians that come in, and, you know, before I do anything, I want to know the immigration circumstances of what's going on, what type of visa they're on. A type O visa may have different restrictions than, a, you know, an H-1B. So I think raising the issue and, and letting your clients know that you're knowledgeable, that these are issues out there, is the best you can do, mm -hmm. but trying to do, you know, give legal advice is, is not right. <laughs> not, yeah, not the way to go. Right? <laughs> but to, to be able to, yeah. It's, it's but I, I know what you're saying. Yes, yeah, not something that you have most the of them think of. Yeah. Right. You have the resource. Right. Well, and and this PowerPoint. I mean, I've got other materials. I mean, I'm happy to share them. I think just creating awareness and being educated on this stuff is. You're, you're going to be miles ahead than not knowing any of it at all, right? Um, one one quick point, I, I see another hand is, you know, at the bottom here, I've got, I'm talking about maybe modified by tax treaty. Remember, we talked about two different types of tax, income tax and transfer tax. There are, I want to say, a hundred, maybe more, income tax treaties that the United States is a party to. There are only 17 state tax treaties that the U.S. is a party to. So if you're working with somebody from, you know, the EU or the more developed countries in the world, most likely there's going to be an estate tax treaty in place. You know, Germany, France, UK, Canada. Um, but if you're working with someone from a smaller or undeveloped country, there may not be an estate tax treaty in place. So. Treaties are important. There's a, there was a question. Uh, from what I'm getting for this is uh, our investors that are foreigners investing money here, they're always trying to protect themselves against that 64,000. Uh, right. Limit, right. Right. Otherwise, they wouldn't invest. And obviously, anybody that's investing millions, they probably have somebody that's telling them this, right? Absolutely. You've got someone. Uh, you've got a foreigner that's trying to invest in the U.S. I would hope that that foreign, I would hope that that foreigner has foreign counsel that is at least initially involved, and then typically how I see it is that foreign counsel is going to contact 
U.S. counsel. So the foreign counsel is the quarterback, is initially involved. Foreign counsel calls U.S. counsel, you know, attorney who's knowledgeable in this area, to help take the taxpayer through the transaction, right? And so one thing we typically see is if a foreigner is buying U.S. real estate and they want to invest in U.S. real estate, um, what they may do is they may try and change the situs of that real estate. So you buy, you buy a house here, your name's on the deed, you own U.S. real estate. You take that U.S. real estate and you put it into a foreign partnership or a foreign corporation, all of a sudden that U.S. real estate is no longer U.S. situs real estate. There's different schools of thought on whether that works. There is no authority from Treasury or in the tax code that says you can do that, but that is one planning technique. Um, just a, a, a couple quick notes. I want to get into FERPTA because it's, it's really cool, um, and I want to make sure we spend enough time on it. <clears throat> we talked about the spousal issue. Many of us are U.S. citizens. If you make a transfer to a U.S. citizen spouse, always look at who you're transferring to. You transfer to a U.S. citizen spouse during lifetime or death, that's a freebie. It's an unlimited exemption. So I have $10 million in my name. I die. My estate tax exemption is $5 million. Well, $5 million is used up with the exemption. The other $5 million is going to go to my wife. That's an unlimited marital deduction to her. There's zero estate tax at my death. That's how the marital deduction works. That rule is much different if the transfer is to a non-citizen spouse. So non-citizen, NRAs or residents, right? Citizen is in one box, non-U.S. citizens are in the other box. You cannot get an unlimited marital deduction for transfers to a non-citizen spouse. And that's during lifetime and at death. So in that example I just gave you, I die with 10 million in my name, I'm a U.S. citizen, great. I get a $5 million exemption. What happens to the other $5 million so I don't pay a state tax on it? Well, it can go to my wife, okay? But if I don't qualify that transfer as a qualified marital deduction, then I don't get the zero tax freebie. If my wife is a non-citizen spouse, okay, and I transfer that $5 million to her outright, there's no unlimited marital deduction. That goes away, okay? This is right here, transfer to non-citizen spouses. But you can get that marital deduction if a QDOT is used. If a QDOT is an acronym for what's called a Qualified Domestic Trust, a very complicated type of trust that's prescribed by the code and the treasury regulations. As estate planners, we would use it if we were doing an estate plan where one of the spouses was a non-citizen. And so in my example, if I die, five million is exempt, the other five goes to my wife through what's called a qualified domestic trust. And if it goes that way, and it's proper, and, it, and it, it's, um, it's compliant, then, then I get that marital deduction. So that's important. That's an important rule you need to know. Um, there's also a annual exclusion for gifts every year that you can make to a non-citizen spouse. So I use the example of my wife again. I give her $5 million tomorrow. She's a U.S. citizen. That's a freebie. There's no gift tax on that. If she's a non-citizen, I cannot give her $5 million without paying gift tax. I can only give her $147,000. That's a big difference. That number goes up every year for inflation, but that is a nugget that you need to take back with you. You cannot make unlimited marital gifts to a non-citizen spouse, okay? I, I think FERPTA is probably one of the, the more complicated sections of the tax code, and the reason for that is the, the sections of FERPTA, there's only a few of them, and there may be a page long, but the regulations on FERPTA are 20, 30, 40 pages. I mean, there are so many different rules that apply under FERPTA, and to try and 
um, teach you FERPTA in 15 minutes will be really tough, but I'm going to do FERPTA in 15. I'm going to do my best <laughs> to at least give you, I think, what, what are the key elements of FERPTA, why we care, and some good issue spotting rules. So, so FERPTA is the acronym for the Foreign, in, Foreign Investment and in Real Property <coughs> Tax Act. This was a big piece of tax legislation passed in 1980. And what it is, is it's a withholding regime. It's going to tax non-resident sellers, foreign sellers of U.S. real estate. And it's going to make sure that whatever the tax liability is, a portion of it's going to be withheld and it's going to be remitted to the federal government. Okay? And why do we have FERPTA? Because remember the beginning of the presentation where we talked about the exemptions to income tax when you have a non-resident that recognizes capital gain? Well, I think the federal government found out that non-residents were investing in the U.S., they were selling real estate, they were not paying any capital gains tax on it, and then they were, instead of reinvesting in the U.S., they were going back to their home country. So there was no benefit here. And so the government changed that rule and made the sale of real estate a taxable event for foreigners. So that's step one, but how does the government know they're going to get the tax? Because, sure, a foreigner can sell real estate here, and let's say there's a $500,000 gain and there's a 20% tax on that, 23.8% now. Great. Well, the foreigner may not care. The foreigner may skip town, go back to his or her home country, and the U.S. government may not have any jurisdiction to try and collect. So, FERPTA is the regime that comes in to say that in a real estate transaction, when you've got a foreign seller, we don't care who the buyer is, but you've got a foreign seller <clears throat> who is selling U.S. real estate or an interest in U.S. real estate, they're going to have a tax liability, but there's going to be withholding from the closing 10% of the sale proceeds that are going to be a payment to the U.S. government to either pay for their capital gain tax or a portion of it, depending on what the gain is. And here is the kicker. The obligation to withhold is not on the seller. It's on the buyer. Okay? The obligation to withhold is on the buyer. So you've got a U.S client who's buying real estate here from a foreign party and the foreign seller is going to recognize you project I don't know three hundred thousand dollars in capital gains tax and your client the US buyer says great not my problem that seller is gonna file a US tax return next year come April report that gain and I don't have anything to do with it. That's wrong. Under FERPTA, the buyer has to withhold the tax liability, or 10% is the rule. And you know who's on the hook if the government doesn't get that withholding amount? The seller will, will be on the hook, but if the seller's gone, the seller doesn't care, the buyer is on the hook, legally. The tax rules say the buyer's on the hook for that tax liability. And if you are an agent or a fiduciary for the buyer, so the lawyer or the title company or the real estate professional, there are rules that say that the agent can potentially also be on the hook. So it's scary, okay? The, the key to FERPTA, I mean, there's three parts to it. One is knowing what the heck it is, you know? I didn't know what it was 10 years ago. Now I'm glad I do. Um, two is understanding who it applies to. And three is, are there any ways around it? Okay, yeah, FERPTA applies here. There is a withholding obligation on the buyer. But is there a way around it? Are there any exemptions to FERPTA? Okay, so that's what I want to talk about. In the materials that you got, um, I wrote an article a couple months ago on FERPTA, and I think it really lays out what FERPTA is, 
you know, what are the tax rates that apply, what are the exemptions, but I want to spend a little time here going through them, okay? Raj? Yeah? I assume we're talking net, not gross, on the proceeds. <coughs> it's 10%, excuse me, of the sale proceeds, okay? Sale proceeds would be the, the purchase price amount, okay? So when you say net, it does not factor in debt or any other um, obligations or security costs. Um, it's it's on the amount realized. Okay. So. Good question. Yep. Remember that rule. NRAs are only taxed on U.S. source income. <coughs> then we learn the rule that U.S. source income doesn't include capital gains, but then we learn the exception to the exception, which is, but capital gain from the sale of real estate is U.S. source. Well, that's what FERP is about. It's, it's the disposition of a U.S. real property interest. We're not talking about rents, okay? We're not talking about rental income. Totally different set of rules that apply there. We're talking about a disposition. Do you have a question? Uh, for example, if it's a rule to have those withholdings from those proceeds, how the, um, the buyer can be on the procure <coughs> if it's withheld already at the time of the sale? How does the buyer what? I'm sorry. Well, how can the buyer be responsible later if it's taken out at the time of the transaction? The buyer won't be exposed or have any potential exposure if at the closing the 10% is withheld and it's held in an escrow and then paid to the IRS. That's what's supposed to happen. has to happen within 20 days. Is it the responsibility of the agent to point that out? Or mm -hmm. That's or the gray, that that's, that's a great question. That's the gray area, okay? So, so yeah. <laughs> the tax rules say that the obligation is on the buyer or the transferee. But he might say, I don't know, I didn't know. Yeah. So, you know, you have to look, at, you have to think about how I'm coming from this. I, I'm a lawyer, so my job is to minimize risk. And I want to protect the transaction from 360 degrees. I don't think like an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs want to get from point A to point B as quickly and as efficiently as possible. I slow the process down. So from my perspective, if I was representing a buyer, yeah, the buyer, the client is on the hook, but when the deal is being drawn up and the purchase agreement is being side, signed, sorry, negotiated, there are going to be a lot of provisions in there addressing FERP to issues and making sure that the buyer, my client, is not liable for any reason if the seller does not pay the tax liability. Okay, and there there are provisions you can put in agreements that address all that. But so, if you don't do any of that, mm -hmm. then to your point, could a buyer say, hey, I didn't know, but you know, I had a real estate lawyer working with me, real estate lawyer never told me anything, I had an accountant, real accountant never told me anything, and I had a real estate agent that walked me through the, the transaction. What happened here? And you might not even know what status the seller is in. You know, I mean, there's many know what the seller's people, is. you know, foreign people here right. who are citizens. And, right. you know, that seller might not disclose that the plan is to leave tomorrow with that cash. I mean, who knows? But if they're citizens, then it doesn't, it doesn't pertain to them, right? No, but uh, what I'm saying is, well, they are not automatically citizens. They can be here for two years or for five years and not be citizens. And you would not ask that question. Oh, yeah. As a buyer, I mean, I'm not going to walk up and say, did you become a citizen while you were here? Do you have plans to go back? You don't ask that question. So I'm saying you honestly might not know. Yeah. So what we'll do is we want to talk through a couple of the elements to help educate you on what you should know. And we're going to talk about some ways that you can protect the buyer. Okay. okay. I want to protect myself as well. <laughs> so, so what is my what is my obligation, or how am I to determine right. the residency or non-residency status of the seller? 
Um, when you are involved in a transaction that involves a seller that is foreign or you think could be foreign or has some foreign ties, you'll want to make sure that you know the classification of that person. So that may be talking to the other party involved, talking to the title company involved, talking to your counsel, okay? That's the first step. If we don't have a foreign seller, we don't have FERPTA, right? Because there has to be a foreign so seller. So I'm looking for a name I can't pronounce or an accent that sounds unfamiliar. I, no. I mean, realistically. No. I mean, because you, you mentioned that FERPTA would be mentioned in the verbiage, but that would only come up after title work was pulled, and then it would ex tell us on there where that seller comes from, because otherwise we wouldn't. Right. No. There's no way if the if the list if the the seller's agent isn't aware of what we're you know what we know right now. I mean it's different, but unless I mean there's you know when the title work comes up, it should say what. I don't know why. Wouldn't it? I don't know why. Maybe their residency. The address. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have. It wouldn't. And if they're Canadian, how do you know what it is? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. One, of the, one of the things, this came up three years ago that I was involved in a transaction where the persons were here but they didn't disclose that they were foreign nationals. And the title companies today have a form, they ask the buyer and seller. So if you're not aware who your client is, there's no way to track them down by name or foreign or accent. That's irrelevant. But the title companies will ask. Right. Are you a foreign investor? Are you buying? And they have to sign that affidavit. But if you haven't been yeah. to closing lately, they're asking that on every closing. So yeah, it's so not the buyer. the buyer and the seller. And they, ask it on yeah. both, they ask it on both sides because the title company is required to ask that and withhold that money. Great so point. Three years ago, I ran into that and that paperwork was there. Great point. We're, we're going to talk about those issues that come up in practice. But I would say now, these days, every transaction that I have looked at where a title company or a bank or a financial institution is involved and there are either foreign parties, even if it's a foreign buyer, there are people that could potentially be foreign. What's going to happen is the third parties, the title companies and the banks are going to want all of the parties signing affidavits that this is not a foreign seller. And that's what protects the buyer and the buyer's agent, is if the seller is certifying that he or she or it is not a foreign person subject to FERPTA, and the buyers rely on that affidavit and that certification, that is how you protect the buyer. Now we'll talk about a couple related issues with that affidavit, but I think that goes to your point and that's how you get protected. And that's really what's done in practice. I just was involved in a transaction where a large uh, brewery in the area um, sold an interest to a foreign, a, a part interest to a, a foreign company, a Spanish company, and this was not a foreign seller. All of the, the sellers were U.S. persons, but the title company, the banks, they all wanted FERPTA certs. They all wanted FERPTA certifications from everybody under the sun making sure that there was no foreign sell. And that's just typically how it's done in practice. Now, you know, I think this is coming up more and more in areas where there are there is a lot of foreign activity. I think title companies have different, um, you know, different methods of addressing FERPTA. But, you know, what we've been doing is we've, if we're involved early enough, we want, um, there would be provisions not only in the purchase agreement, but any kind of agreement between the buyer or the seller and their agent that um, removes liability. That's really what it comes down to. So. Sounds like the other line for our purchase agreement. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. What's the, I'm sorry, the time? The, how much longer um, should we go? I, well, I think we started later, so I think uh, okay. we started probably closer to 12.30. Okay, so it's one oh five. I can finish up here in about 5-10 minutes, and uh, we can have some time to question. I think they're prepared to go till one thirty. are you not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. you're, you're good. We'll keep it going. 
So th this is an important slide, slide 16. Put, a, put an asterisk on this side. This is, this is a good definition of FERPTA, when FERPTA applies. When you have a foreign seller involved in the transaction, FERPTA imposes on the buyer, in general, 10% withholding tax of the total amount realized from the disposition of a U.S. real property interest. I underline key terms that we need to understand. We need to know what foreign means. We need to know <clears throat> what disposition means. We need to know what a U.S. real property interest means. Okay? Ignore the 35%. We are not going to go into the additional layer of FERPTA rules, but just so you know, when you have foreign trusts or some foreign enti entities that are involved in a transaction and they're distributing assets, 35% withholding may apply. But what we are focused on today is the general rule, 10%. Okay. The amount that is withheld, this is the 10%. That is paid to the IRS. That is on the buyer to remit that. There are forms that the IRS has. Form 8288 will be in this presentation. Most title companies will know this. In fact, title companies have their own attorneys that look at these issues and make sure that the title companies have the proper forms. Um, we're seeing it more and more. And the amount withheld is paid to the IRS, and that's within 20 days of the closing. Okay? <laughs> These are the general rules. Are there exceptions to all of this business? Absolutely. There are exceptions to withhold. Under the FERPTA <coughs> rules, we're going to go through those. So, so number one, rule number one, don't think that if you don't, you know, if you have a foreign individual, I'm sorry, don't assume that FERPTA only applies to foreign individuals. FERPTA can also apply to foreign entities. It can apply to foreign trusts. It also applies to a U.S. corporation that holds real estate. Okay? It applies to a U.S. corporation that holds real estate. And we're going to talk about that. This is the, the takeaway on this slide. We're on slide 18. We've talked about who's a foreign seller. It's not just an individual. It can be entities. What's a U.S. real property interest? It's not just dirt. It's not just land or buildings. And if the minerals or the oil, anything has not been extracted from the land, it includes those. But a U.S. real property interest also includes shares of stock in a U.S. corporation. And there's a tax <coughs> there. So if the foreign seller, instead of just selling real estate, is selling interests in a U.S. corporation that owns real estate, you still may have a FERPTA issue. And then you have to kind of look at a use test. You have to understand, well, how much real estate is in this U.S. corporation? Is it enough? And generally has to be more than 50% of the value has to be in U.S. real estate interests. Then it will be a U.S. real property holding corporation. And that constitutes a U.S. real property interest. Okay? What about disposition? Remember that first slide we talked about FERPTA applies to a disposition of real estate. It's not just a sale. Okay? In your world, you deal with a lot of sales. What I do as an estate planner is I may deal with some like-kind exchanges, I may deal with some gifts, I may deal with some distributions from a partnership, I may deal with some reorgs. FERPTA applies to all of those. It applies to any transfer that would constitute a disposition for any purpose of the Internal Revenue Code and regulations. What the heck? That is the broadest definition <coughs> that applies to FERPTA. And so we have to understand that it's not just a sale, per se. 
Slide 20 talks about the exemptions. <coughs> if you have insomnia, you can go to the Internal Revenue Code, Section 1445, and start reading. <laughs> I've tried to sum it up here on a couple slides. Common exemptions to FERPTA. This one right here is the biggest one that we see. The seller gives the buyer a certification saying, this is a sworn statement under penalties of perjury, that the seller is not a foreign person, okay? The buyer can rely on that. Here is the, here's the issue with that, okay? If the buyer or the buyer's agent, agent being lawyer, accountant, real estate agent, anybody else that's helping with the transaction, learns or becomes aware that this certification is BS and the, the seller is actually a foreign person, then that agent has a duty to report. That agent has a duty to disclose and give notice to the IRS. So that's what you need to know, okay? And I suggest before, if you ever come into that situation and you do see a FERPTA certification, but just in your own good due diligence or talking to other people, you learn or find out that this person could actually be a foreign person, trust your gut and look into it because if you have knowledge of it and don't disclose it at that point, you could ultimately be on the hook for some tax liability, okay? And before you pick up the phone and call the IRS, talk to the people involved in the transaction, okay? Talk to the title company, talk to your attorney, talk to your accountant because the last thing you want to do is provide notice to the IRS when it may have been, you know, on a hunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That gets me irritated. <laughs> <laughs> um, another exemption is, and this is typically done when, on larger transactions, when there's going to be a significant amount of tax liability and there are a team of professionals involved, you know, multiple um, parcels. I, I just, I guess the point is I see it in larger transactions. But what's gonna happen is the buyer or the seller is going to apply in advance of the closing for a withholding certificate. And they may apply for, for many different reasons. The common reasons are, look, we've calculated the tax liability and the tax liability to the seller is gonna be much less than this 10% business. So why do we have to withhold 10% if at the end of the day, the seller has to pay less in tax to the IRS? So you can apply for a reduced amount of withholding. Another reason you may apply for withholding is that um, there may be a zero withholding amount and there could be situations where there may be no tax liability at all. I mean, think about you know selling in, in depressed markets, think about um, think about situations where there is a really unique transaction. Maybe it involves a REIT. Maybe it involves a U.S. corporation that holds 45% of value in real estate interests, and you just want to be absolutely sure. So you're asking the IRS for permission to not have to withhold. And so these things are all done in advance of a closing. The IRS typically takes 90 days to process these things. Mm -hmm. That means don't go to your team of professionals the day before the closing and say, we gotta apply <laughs> for a certification, let's do this. Um, you, wanna, you wanna look at these issues in advance and think about whether you wanna apply for a withholding certificate. Um, another exemption I've been seeing more of with the influx of international families coming to Grand Rapids is when the buyer acquires the property for personal use, okay, as a residence. And so there's a use test that we have to satisfy and there's an amount realized test. $300,000 is the amount realized test. So if you've got a, a single family home and the value is 300,000 or less and dad who came to the US who's a non-resident sells the property to his kids who are U.S. residents. Well, do we have a FERPTA issue? Initially, we do. FERPTA applies. Is there an exemption? Well, maybe we can fit it in this box because 
the kids are going to use the property as personal use. Okay. I'm not going to spend time on slide 21. These are just the forms that you will typically see in a FERPTA transaction. And you can Google these forms. And, and sometimes I find that actually reading through the actual compliance documents helps you understand FERPTA and the transaction a little bit. Um, FERPTA recap. Just remember it's often overlooked in real estate transactions. You want to focus on who is the seller. You want to focus on even if we don't have a foreign seller, it may be a good idea to get FERPTA affidavits from everybody. And like I said, I've seen this done as general practice with financial institutions and title companies. Um, FERPTA withholding is on the buyer, okay? FERPTA withholding may fall on the buyer's agent. That's not a default rule, but we live in a crazy litigious society, and I think you have to be extra careful when you get involved in representing someone that you don't know or trust or you've done business with for a long time. And even in those situations, you need to look out for yourself. But it may fall on the buyer's agent if the buyer was led to believe or had some agreement in place or some understanding that my agent was going to take care of all this. Okay? And those really deal with the laws of agency. But FERPTA withholding rules have exemptions. So once you can identify a FERPTA transaction, you go through the rules, you spot the issues, and know that there are exemptions. How do you fit it into a box where maybe we can get out of this withholding obligation? Okay? In some situations, you may want to withhold. Okay? Just to make sure that it's clean, you don't trust the seller, um, there's some risk that you feel that this tax liability will never get paid. So there may be situations where you want to withhold, even if there's an exemption. And FERPTA has forms. So we've done FERPTA in 15, has forms, a lot more Fs I can think of, including a very bad word, but um, that's FERPTA. There's a question in the back. Question? Yeah? What if uh, you as an attorney or me as a realtor represent a seller who is a foreign person and he and buyer is not represented by anybody, right? Just buyer directly from you, and the former person goes back home, doesn't pay that tax. Yeah. Are they going to come on you or me? I mean, IRS as the only person of interest in this case. I mean, there's no buyer's agent. That's my point. Right. Well, we know that the tax liability for the seller is still there. It's always going to be there the seller skips the country, the seller is still going to have a tax liability. And so I would be nervous as the seller's agent, as the attorney. More so, I would be nervous than you as a real estate professional that was just involved in that aspect, that my client has skipped the country and is not paying his or her tax liability. Um, whether the IRS is going to come after me personally, I mean, I think the IRS can do whatever they want, but I'm going to protect myself by making sure I understand all this and I advise my client that he or she has a tax liability and that's on you. Um, the, the, the withholding obligation is kind of a carve out of the tax liability. So you got a $100,000 sale, you got a 30% uh, tax on it, let's say. So 30 grand is owed to the IRS. The withholding amount is only 10,000 though, right? 10%. So that 10% carve out, that's on the buyer. And if the buyer doesn't withhold and the buyer was supposed to withhold, the buyer's gonna be on the hook for interest and penalties and potentially the seller's tax liability. Now what I would do personally is when I'm engaged in any kind of transaction where um, 
the parties have different rights and obligations and the interests are not aligned, I will want to make sure everyone's represented. Because then there's less room for error and um, I just think that's the right thing to do. Um, it's 120. I, I'm just going to uh, make two points with trap four and trap number five. Trap number four deals with trust migration. And what I mean by that is sometimes foreigners who come here and buy real estate, or if they're selling real estate, <clears throat> if a foreigner ever becomes a U.S. person, so let's say you're working with a green card holder, and the green card holder buys real estate, and the green card holder puts real estate in his or her living trust, okay, and it's set up by a... Grand Rapids attorney, it's a Michigan trust. The purpose is for estate planning, but also so the property can go to this person's kids when they die. Great, no problems. But because this green card holder is a foreigner and has family overseas, this green card holder wants to name family members overseas as the trustees of his or her trust. Okay? That's going to potentially create another trap called trust migration where this US trust now because of the people in charge as trustee being overseas now becomes a foreign trust under the tax law and if you have a foreign trust you have a slew of tax issues that come up a potential deemed sale so it'll be treated as if all the assets in that trust were sold and that owner of the trust is going to have gain You've got tax consequences to the beneficiaries, so when distributions happen, there's this different foreign regime of income tax rules that apply because it's a foreign trust. So the key is when you're working with, the issue spotting is when you're working with clients who are buying real estate or, and, and there's a trust in the picture, I mean, and that happens. Maybe a trust is selling, a trust is buying, person intends to buy the property and then put it in their trust. This is a great thing to know know that if the trust has people in charge who are foreigners or for some reason a foreign court can have jurisdiction over that trust it's going to be a potential foreign trust and that's a great that's a great issue to point out for your clients trap number five is compliance um, this is page 26 <clears throat> If we're talking about NRAs for income tax purposes, and this is my last point that I'm going to finish up. <clears throat> NRAs for income tax purposes, okay? So they, they don't have a green card and they haven't been here long enough. Well, we typically see NRAs become U.S. residents. How do they become U.S. residents? Well, they've had a visa for a while. They apply for a green card and they get their green card. They are now a U.S. resident for income tax purposes. Or the non-resident has spent enough time here where they've met this, what's called a substantial presence test. It's, 100, it's 183 days, which is, which is measured or calculated by an average of days for three years in a row. And whoever wants to talk about the test, I can, I can talk to you about it. But when these NRAs become residents, all of a sudden, as soon as they become a U.S. resident for income tax purposes, all of these acts apply. There's the Foreign Bank Account Reporting Secrecy Act, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, the HIRE Act, Heroes Assistance and Relief Tax Act, FBARS, you may have heard about that acronym before. If you are a U.S. person and you have bank accounts overseas in the aggregate of $10,000 or more, You've got to file this form with the IRS every summer. And if you don't, there are going to be problems. There's FATCA. FATCA is a new piece of legislation that says if you are a U.S. person and you have foreign assets, like real estate, you've got to disclose that and file FATCA compliance forms every year with your tax return. If you don't, problems. PFIX and CFCs, these are passive foreign <coughs> investment companies, controlled foreign corporations, more compliance, more obligations. And then the exit tax, this is the big one. If you, we think of an exit tax in the US as a, as a US citizen giving up their citizenship. I don't wanna be here anymore. I wanna go move to India and be with my family. I'm gonna give up my citizenship. 
there's going to be an exit tax that's going to be assessed on me, and then I've got to go through the rules to see if I have to pay any tax. The exit tax also applies to residents. It applies to long-term residents. So if you have a client who has had their green card for eight years, the exit tax regime applies. So you've got a client, they're thinking of selling their place here in Michigan and leaving the country and going overseas, and you know that they have a green card. This may be a good issue to raise. You may want to take a look and see if you're part of this exit tax regime that applies. What range is the exit tax? Percentage range. Um, well, the, it's basically an income tax that, that applies. So mm -hmm. it means that when you leave the U.S. on that day, you look at all of your worldwide assets, and the U.S. government is going to treat it as if you have sold all your assets on that day. Okay. Thanks. Then there is an exemption that applies. It's in the 600,000s, and there are other rules that will apply. But the bottom line is, if, if you can prevent someone from leaving the U.S. because they may be subject to this estate tax regime, it, that's a good thing. You want to have them check it out and make sure that either it doesn't apply to them or there are exemptions that apply. Okay? And just these are just more forms that you can look at. Questions? I have a question on page 10 of the notes when I talked about the IRC, IRC 1445 outline exemptions. Under the first bullet point, it says the seller gives the buyer a certificate stating they're not a foreign person. How does that, how does that coincide or not coincide with the fair housing laws? Just randomly asking people their status, if they're a citizen or not. That <coughs> Great question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I will call my real estate colleague and find out. But that's a great point. I don't know if there's some confidentiality or invasion of privacy issues. Um, well, I work with a lot of migrant workers, and I don't want um, people saying, well, I'm not going to sell you a house because you're not a citizen, or because you don't have to be a citizen to purchase property here. Right. Right. No, good point. I don't know the answer. And I have a question. For example, I, I'm sure that, you know, I, not, I'm sure, I know that you're not a specialist in that, but I'm sure that you have general knowledge. Um, how does that um, go in comparison with other countries? For example, if uh, people from other countries want to invest in UK or some other, like, European countries, is that uh, the same with like the pretty much the same with the state and um, sale or it like you asked laws are actually more complicated and maybe less advantageous or uh, yeah well so we can talk after there's, I think there's a lot of. There's a lot I can tell you, but the short answer is the U.S. tax system is actually, it's very complicated, but there are a lot more complicated tax regimes. The United Kingdom has a very complicated tax regime. Um, uh, Canada has a very complicated tax regime. I think uh, the U.S. will tax its citizens no matter where they are in the world, okay? That's not the case with many other countries. So we're very, um, the scope of our tax system is very broad, um, but there are system is, systems in place where U.S. citizens or residents won't pay tax twice, and the reason for that is because if they're paying tax in a foreign country and they're paying tax in the U.S. on that same income, there's either going to be a, a, hopefully a treaty in place that will make sure that tax is only paid to one country, or there's gonna be what's called a foreign tax credit. So if you're paying tax to a foreign country, you're gonna get a credit against your US tax liability because of what you've paid overseas. So it's not totally punitive. Um, 
there are ways to address the, the worldwide taxation regime, right? And because non-residents are only taxed on their U.S. CITUS assets, there's a lot of planning, as you can imagine, that goes into that, right? There are a lot, there, for state planning lawyers, for tax lawyers, there's a lot of different things that can be done um, with those rules. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, a couple things I want to